What is up guys? Welcome back to my channel. Today's video is going to be a lot more serious than the videos that I typically make for this channel. I'm going to be looking at some photos that were taken on the ground in Ukraine by photojournalists and photographers and I'm going to kind of examine these photos and make some commentary on them. I want to talk a bit about kind of the experience of photojournalists and photographers in this conflict. I'm also going to go a little bit into the philosophical aspect of photography and photojournalism in times of war. I don't want to be too analytical about it, but I do want to talk a little bit about the utility of photojournalism and just some things that I've learned about photography that apply to my analysis of these photos. So I'm not trying to be insensitive at all, but I just wanted to make that disclaimer just in case. Yeah, okay. So without further ado, let's get started. So one of the first photos that came out of the Ukraine conflict and really struck with an international audience is this one of Olena Kurilo. She's a 52 year old teacher who was injured by a missile strike. And this photo was taken shortly after that missile strike while she was still disoriented and likely concussed from the impact. Wolfgang Schwann is a 31 year old photojournalist and he was the one who took this image. His Instagram is full of similarly moving images of this conflict. And the thing that strikes me the most looking at his Instagram is how the photos that he takes transition from being pretty much exclusively of soldiers in trenches, things like that, in the early days of this conflict to being more focused on civilians and their survival in this conflict zone after the invasion began. He says that he arrived on scene and that they needed to use Google Translate to communicate with her. She was clearly disoriented and he says likely concussed. And I think that that is why she has this look on her face that is so unreadable. It's hard to decide how to feel about Wolfgang's method of capturing this image. Because on the one hand, you have a young foreign photographer showing up and snapping a picture at what is probably one of the most vulnerable moments of this woman's life. She is still disoriented, so she doesn't really have the wherewithal to even consent to the photo being taken. And it does seem wrong to shove a camera in someone's face at that point. But that said, these images need to get made. This photo in particular reminds me of the photos of bomb victims crawling out of the wreckage after Hiroshima. And those were horrifying images, also taken at the most vulnerable times in these people's lives. And yet we can clearly understand why these photos were taken. And you have this conceptual understanding of what the atom bomb did, having it described to you. But looking at these pictures, you have a better grasp of the real human impact of that kind of destruction. So I read a book recently called Camera Lucida by Roland Barthes, and he attempts to define what separates photography from film. He asks the question, why do photographs hit us differently than videos? He says it's because videos are a series of images slipping past us faster than we can consciously be aware of them. No one instant is more important than the next, and the video has a duration, so you have to stare at it and watch it for a period of time before you get the impact that is intended by the video clip. But a photograph forces you to stop and look, to really look at this one instant. It says, look at this. It captures a specific moment in time, and it only takes a single moment for you to be impacted by that photograph. I think in this photograph of Olena, as with the historical photographs of Hiroshima, the image itself is horrifying, but what is really horrifying is the knowledge that this is only one moment out of many, one instantaneous fragment of the full horror that has happened, and you don't have any context on either side of the image being taken like you would with a video. You don't know how horrible every other moment is, but you know that this one in particular was. Video, like I said, has duration. We know how the moment begins, we have an idea of how it ends. There's an arc to a video. We can infer what is happening on either side of it. And we have thousands of frames in a video. So we have much more information to extrapolate our assumptions of what that event meant. But in a photo, you just have that one instant and the countless possibilities of what might have lay on either side of it. We look into the unnervingly calm eyes of Olena and her unreadable expression looking back at us and we have no context for this except for the blood on her face and the bandages that cover it. So Wolfgang Schwann, the photojournalist who captured Alina, says that when you have something terrible happening in front of you, you have this little device that you can put between you and what you're seeing and that helps. He says he'll probably cry in the shower when he gets home, but for now, as long as I stay busy, I'm good. I think 
that is a really interesting observation from a photojournalist who is constantly exposed to really horrible events as part of their job. That you have this one piece of familiarity, this one constant, and that is your camera. By selecting one moment out of thousands to photograph, the photojournalist distances themselves from the extent of the event. They ignore the other moments and elements of context, and they select that one frame. They ground themselves in what is known, what has happened. And it seems like the act of taking this kind of photo has the opposite effect on the photojournalist than it has on the viewer. The photographer, knowing the context on either side of the image, feels better about confining it to one frame, whereas the viewer, with no concept of the rest of the event, feels uncomfortable without that knowledge. And what is really disturbing in both cases is what lies outside of the single frame. So, Roland Barthes, again in his book, Camera Lucida, also talks about two components of a photograph. And I'm not really gonna touch on these, but I want you to keep this in mind looking at the rest of the photographs in this video. So he says that a photograph has studium and punctum. Studium is the part of the photo that we need context in order to understand. So in many pictures of war, we see soldiers and rubble and overturned cars and we don't really understand what is happening other than that it is a war zone unless we know why the war is going on and where. Otherwise, the image slips past us as a collection of easily recognizable symbols without specific grounding in material reality. The punctum, however, is the aspect of the photo that jumps out at you regardless of the context in the rest of the photo. You don't need to understand what's going on to be impacted by this element. And I think the reason why this photo of Alina, as with the other photos that we will look at, is so impactful, is so striking, is because it is all punctum. The mere fact that this older woman who's bleeding and bandaged is staring straight at the camera with this unreadable expression is enough to strike the viewer regardless of the context. And as we look at more images from this conflict, Keep this studium and punctum dynamic in mind because many of these images are just as striking without knowing the full context as they would be after reading the artist's statement. So the next section is called international photojournalists. And so these are people who are hired by international newspapers to go into Ukraine and document the conflict. After this, I've got a section on Ukrainian photographers and photojournalists, so stay tuned for that as well. I'm gonna stop talking about theory, but keep those things in mind while we're looking at these images. So, Lindsay Adario is a photojournalist who has been photographing war for 20 years. She's very accomplished, she's been in many war zones, her website is full of very impactful photos, and she was covering the evacuation of civilians from the city of Irpin when a mortar shell hit and killed a mother and her two children right in front of her. And there's a video of this happening, and you can see that she keeps her camera up and snapping in front of her the entire time. And at the end of the video, you can hear her ask, should we go over and film it? And she's like pointing over across the road to a spot where a mortar shell had literally just hit moments before. And so she took this photo, which I'm not going to show. I'm not sure to what extent I can show pictures of people who have died on YouTube without it actually being taken down. But go and look at this photo. It's on her Instagram. It's on the New York Times, but it shows the mother and her two children immediately after their deaths. And she says that she does feel like it was disrespectful to take this photo, but that it had to be taken. And I would agree, it, it was disrespectful to take it, but it had to be taken because that photo shows that civilians are being targeted as they escape, which was not something that was internationally known before. She says something also that's very similar to the quote I read earlier from Wolfgang, and that's, when I'm working, I try to stay focused. I try to keep the camera to my eye. And in the video of her witnessing this war crime, she does just that. Another photojournalist I wanna to touch on is Los Angeles Times photographer Marcus Yam. He has been taking really incredible and really striking photos of the whole conflict. But one of the photos that struck me the most was this one of him and a nine-year-old girl who had gifted him an embroidered heart that she had been working on while sheltering with her family in Kiev. So this photo shows the pair with the heart between them. And in the background, we can see an older woman sitting on the ground. We see somebody carrying luggage, baggage against a pillar, and elements that root this scene in a recognizable modernity. And this photo looks both mundane and unusual because you've seen all the elements in this frame a million times, but you're not used to seeing them together. And the knowledge of why they're together is disturbing. So here's a photo that Yam took a few days prior to the Russian invasion of Kiev. 
and here's a picture that he took in the subway during the invasion, and here's a picture that he took above ground during the invasion. Emilio Morinati is the chief photographer of the Associated Press in Spain and Portugal, and he is covering the war in Ukraine as well. And he has this photo of a father carrying his child across a destroyed bridge, and he's also got these photos of people saying goodbye to their loved ones through train windows. But the photo of his that strikes me the most is this one of a crowd escaping under the bombed out bridge. The frame is broken cleanly into thirds. The rule of thirds is like one of the rules that you learn when you're studying photography. It's a classic, but here it is done in a very impactful way. So the top third shows an ordinary suburb covered in rubble and cars and soldiers. And then the middle third shows concrete and twisted metal. And then the lower third, which is by far the most colorful and eye-catching third, is a crowd of people. The way that the people just catch your eye immediately and then you read it bottom up. It's, it's a very impactful photo. And another aspect, after looking at this photo a little longer, that I realized is that he's actually on the bridge above the people, but away from the soldiers. So potentially he's put himself at risk by getting out into the open away from protection in order to take this photo. It's terrifying to think about intentionally separating yourself from both the crowd of people and the soldiers for the sheer purpose of documenting the scene. But if you were to document it from the soldiers, if one of the soldiers took out their camera and took a picture, or if somebody in the crowd took out their camera and took a picture, they wouldn't be able to capture this full scene. So you need a photojournalist, you need somebody who's willing to put themselves at risk and go somewhere unprotected in order to get these shots. And all of these international photojournalists who I've talked about have intentionally put themselves at risk. They've flown to Ukraine knowing that it's an active war zone. We see Lindsay Adario literally running into the path of missiles to get a photo. And we see that photo. And it's all the more impactful because somebody had to risk their own safety in order to capture it. So all of these people, because they're intentionally putting themselves at risk, I'm sure that that has an impact on the kinds of photos that they produce of the conflict. They're not caught up in the conflict unintentionally, they're there by choice. I'm not gonna try and interpret that in my analysis of their work, uh, but it's something that I want you to keep in mind while you're looking at the next set of photos that I have, which are taken by Ukrainian photojournalists and photographers. Mikhail Palinchak, he's a Ukrainian photographer who took a lot of really dynamic street photos and really, really cool still life type stuff before the conflict. He's a very talented photographer and is now photographing the conflict from inside Kiev. So he took this photo of a husband and wife pair who were married on the day of the Russian invasion and have spent their honeymoon in the Territorial Defense Forces. Another compelling image from Palinchak is this one, looking up at an apartment building in the weeks before the invasion. You've got these horizontal lines interrupted by a man staring out, scrutinizing the scene in front of him and smoking a cigarette. This scene seems to represent a quiet moment in a loud time, both literally and visually. The man and his solemn expression breaking up a visually loud scene. Finally, from Palinchak, I want to share this photo of a territorial defenseman preparing a weapon in the dark. This photo is very similar to Palinchak's earlier works before the conflict, where he has this very stark lighting and dramatic use of harsh shadows. But instead of being drawn to focus on an inanimate object, as with his other work, you're drawn to focus on the stern, concentrated expression of a man at war. And the man himself is fixated on his hands. You see nothing in his expression except for focus. He has been placed in this situation that is inescapable. The only way to get out of it is to go through it. And the only way to go through it is to focus on the task at hand. And in this case, it's loading a gun in the dead of night. Next, I have Mstislav Chanov. He is a Ukrainian photojournalist with the Associated Press. And his Instagram is full of very graphic images of the conflict, photos and videos of civilians dying in hospitals while medical staff try to revive and save their lives. And, and one particularly striking image of his is this photo of a father crying over the covered body of his dead son. And there's a video of medical staff trying to revive this patient and being unsuccessful. I'm not gonna show any of that, again, because of YouTube with dead bodies and things like that, I'm not sure, but go check out his Instagram. It's, it is hard to look at, but it gives you a very accurate idea of how this conflict impacts real people. So another striking image from Chernov's Instagram a little bit before the conflict is this one of a young girl yelling as she is firing a rifle. 
And this was in the days before the invasion when Russian troops were amassing along the border and civilians were being trained in the operation of firearms. A lot of these images, I really cannot fathom how it would feel to be in that situation, but this one I feel, I can imagine how it would have felt to be out there in the snow in a time of such uncertainty and fear, training with a deadly weapon and having the understanding that this skill might actually come in handy in the near future. You know, I've, I've held BB guns before, I've done archery before, but it's always just been a fun thing. It's never been with the assumption that one day I'll have to like apply this skill against invaders. But in this case, that is her assumption. And you can see that written on her face, right? I think Chernov has captured it very well. Two more images from Chernov that I wanna share is this one of a soldier in the dark smoking a cigarette. It's just a very impactful photo. And also this one of a dentist standing in the basement of his clinic, which is being used as a bomb shelter because the basement has so many rooms. Both of these photos are all punctum. I, I don't need to understand any context to be emotionally impacted by these photos. So the last photographer, photographers who I want to talk about are not photojournalists. They are Ukrainian photographers and they're a husband and wife couple. They have an Instagram called Libkos and their names are Konstantin and Vlado Liberov. Before the war, they photographed mostly very beautiful cinematic painterly images, very warm and often full of romantic scenes, couples kissing, dancing, embracing, and comparing these photos to the images that they captured of themselves during the conflict, the two of them looking at projected images of the war. This image set really reminds me of some of the creative images that came out during quarantine, the first months of quarantine. And I personally remember feeling at that point in quarantine, like every ounce of creativity had been drained from my body and replaced by stress. And I can imagine it would be very similar in this situation where you're watching your country being invaded and you don't know what's coming next. All of the news is happening at once. I have no idea how this husband and wife couple have managed to put themselves together enough to be creative and take a creative photo like this, but I think it really does capture the emotions that they must be feeling very well. All you can do is look, right? And in these photos, all they're doing is looking. I really respect that they had the wherewithal to create this image set and yeah, to be creative. Another set that they captured is this series of husband and wife couples saying goodbye to each other through train windows. So a lot of men are trapped in the Ukraine right now and they're sending their loved ones to safety who are able to escape. And you see the expressions on their faces. And a lot of them have the same kind of smile almost, but you know that it's not a smile out of joy. It's hard to fathom what that emotion must feel like, but I think that Libkos does a very good job of capturing it. It really reminds me actually of the photos that came out of the Second World War of people saying goodbye to their loved ones on trains, especially these ones of children being evacuated from cities in Britain. But those photos were very low fidelity and we don't really get to see the nuances of their expressions. Whereas in these photos, you do see the nuances of their expressions. You can see more of the details of how they're experiencing this. Yeah, so that is all of the photos that I had for you. That is all of the photographers who I wanted to talk about. Obviously the conflict is still developing and there's plenty of images coming out every single day. There's plenty of photographers going to Ukraine, leaving Ukraine. So this video might be a little out of date by the time I post it, but I think it's still very important to look at these images. I think that it's important that we do our best to learn about this conflict through a variety of visual media. I say visual media because at this point there is so much misinformation and propaganda going around, but what is clear from all of these photos is the impact that war has on people who are caught up in it, the people who did nothing to precipitate it, and who can do nothing to prevent it or escape it. I don't need to read the author's statements to understand these photos, and I think that that is one of the reasons why photojournalism and photography is so important in documenting conflict. But that said, I also think it's very important that we continue to learn from a variety of visual media like videos and even TikToks and user-generated content, I think are very important pieces to understand, but taken all, all together, not individually. So I really hope that by looking at these images, regardless of how you feel about the cause of the war or the days leading up to the war, I hope that you get a better idea of what war does to civilians, to people, individuals and communities and a better sense of why it is so important to document these events, why it is so important that photojournalists exist and despite 
how rude it might be to shove the camera in the face of somebody who is grieving, why it is very important to document that moment. Yeah, very emotional video. Thank you guys for watching. I know it's not my typical fare. I have been very impacted by these photos over the last two weeks. As I've been doing my research for this video, I follow a lot of these people on Instagram and they see their stories every day and it is definitely like hitting me as it should be hitting you. So I'd recommend that you go and follow some of these people who I've talked about. I will have all of their information down in the description below so you can go and follow them on Instagram and keep up with the photos that are being made. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate that you took the time and take care. Keep shooting.